Southern Baptist Church friends and family. Glad you guys could join us this evening. Have a brief devotional relates to the uh, resurrection story of Jesus Christ. This occurs, of course, as the title says, one week later. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of John. The text will be on the screen. I typically use the ESV, English Standard Version. You're welcome to follow along on the screen or use your version that you like. We'll begin tonight in John chapter 20, picking up in verse 24 and following. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now the phrase one of the twelve is a moniker or a nickname for the collection of the disciples. And this is used of the disciples long after Judas has hanged himself and is, is passed on. Now, even though there's eleven disciples at this point, the, 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 the phrase the twelve will be used to describe the disciples as a collective group, even though there's less than that. Uh, Matthias will be ch chosen as replacement the disciple. But that's going to be in the book of Acts another six, seven weeks out from now before a replacement disciple is picked. So the twelve just is a phrase that uh, refers to the disciples collectively. Also, Thomas is called the twin, and the twin is a nickname. Now, why is he called the twin? Some speculate that he's called the twin because he looks like Jesus. He has physical features that look like Jesus. We don't like to be certain. Maybe he was a an actual twin. Maybe he had a twin brother or sister back home. We don't know why he's called the twin. I mean, I've read different uh, interpretations why Didymus is used there. The nickname Didymus is used uh, for Thomas. Maybe because he looked like Christ. I like that one the best, but again, you're not going to have strong convictions on this, I don't think. Verse 25. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Now, if you read last week's text, if you were here last time for the last Sunday evening service on Easter Sunday night, you know that Thomas was absent. The other ten disciples were there, which begs the question, where was Thomas? What, where was he during this time when the other disciples were, were present in the upper room, uh, locked in for fear of the Jews, for fear of being outed by the Jews and towed over the Roman authorities uh, for following this uh, insurrectionist? Where was Thomas? Well, we don't know where he was. Uh, likely he was in hiding, just another location, but he wasn't present. That's an important detail. He's not present with the disciples on Easter Sunday evening in the upper room. Now, Thomas will not believe. They'll come and they'll tell Thomas, look, we've seen the Lord. He was with us uh, in person, face to face, in the upper room. He appeared. The doors were locked. He came into the room with us, and, um, and he was really, it was really Jesus. Now, Thomas doesn't believe. And you know why Thomas doesn't believe? Because resurrections just don't happen. Resurrections are uncommon, and they were uncommon supernatural events. Don't think that resurrections were commonplace events, that people didn't just come back from the dead. Uh, people, modern scholarship, uh, modern scholars, I'll say, uh, look at the, old, the ancient world and say, well, those folks are just superstitious, and that they believed in uh, people raising from the dead all the time. That wasn't the case. The reason why people uh, didn't believe the resurrection of Christ is because it was a very uncommon experience. And that's the reason Thomas doesn't believe. The same reason you and I wouldn't believe if someone had said to us, uh, down at the funeral home where Uncle George, was, uh, body was being laid uh, for preparation, he's alive now. Well, we wouldn't believe that either because resurrections just don't happen. Folks just don't come back from the dead. Look what Thomas says. He said, but he, but he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now Thomas asks for very specific and concrete evidence of a resurrected Jesus. He wants to see the wounds from the cross. He wants to see the, the passion marks in his body. He wants to see the, um, the injuries from, from Good Friday. He wants to see the physical evidence that Christ has been, that it's not a stand-in. It's not someone posing this cross. He wants to see the real Christ who was crucified to come back from the dead. You know, folks just didn't survive a Roman crucifixion. Uh, the Romans made sure that when you were to be crucified, that they saw it to the very end, that you were crucified, that you died. And so Thomas says, unless I have evidence and can see physical, physical, tangible Jesus here, can see the wounds, I'm never going to believe that. Well, Thomas has been called, nicknamed over the, over the years, Doubting Thomas. And it's a very unfair nickname. In fact, the origin of this nickname uh, it really comes from the 17th century. About 1,600 years after the events of this story, do we find the beginnings of this nickname, Doubting Thomas. It just wasn't a common, uh, it, was, it wasn't even heard of 
it wasn't a common expression until the 17th century. So uh, it's the, the apostles never would have said, yeah, you're a doubting Thomas to Thomas. It certainly was unheard of. And I'll show you uh, from biblical text in the Gospel of John why he does not earn, doesn't deserve that nickname. If you go back in Christ's ministry, John chapter 11, you know the story of Lazarus uh, is found in the entire chapter, the entire Lazarus narrative is contained in John chapter 11. And in the beginning of John chapter 11, Jesus gets word that, the, that his friend from Bethany, a man named Lazarus, is sick and he's dying. And the news first comes to him and he says, well, if he's, if he's sick, uh, he'll, you know, if he's sleeping, he'll recover. Uh, and he, he says that to the messengers and the disciples say, well, well, good, if he's sleeping, he'll get better, is what they say to Jesus. And then Jesus says, no, no, uh, Thomas is dead. Jesus would deliberately wait there after the, de after the death of, Tom after death of uh, Lazarus. And then he says, you know, we must now go to Bethany to raise Lazarus. And Thomas, the same one we call Doubting Thomas, the same one we, we say has no courage and no conviction about him, the same one that we say his faith is fickle, is the one that speaks up and says, let us go that we may die with him. Now, Bethany was about two miles away from Jerusalem. It's, a, it's the suburbs of Jerusalem, if you will. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, it's very clear that there's a bounty on his head. They've already decided, the religious leaders in Jerusalem have already decided to, uh, to capture Jesus and to, uh, to cru have him crucified or turned over to the Romans. And in fact, if you want to find this in the Gospel of John, way back in John chapter 7, there's a plot to kill Jesus. And we find it two or three times in the Gospel of John where it says they had a plot to kill him. And so this is a well-known fact. And so in spite of this, Thomas says, let's, let's go to all the way down to Bethany, that, in the borders of Jerusalem with Jesus, that we may die with him. And that's an interesting detail. So Thomas doesn't deserve to be called a doubter. Uh, he's very courageous, in fact. But we, we think of him for this one event in his life. Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now the phrase eight days la later is a way of expressing that it was uh, the next Sunday night. So, and I know it would sound like it be the next Monday night, or if you're counting eight, eight actual days from the previous Easter Sunday evening. But in fact, the way the Jews reckon time, according to Josephus, this expression, eight days later, would have referred to the very same day the following week. So eight days later. Count the days you were on, from all the way to counting the day that you uh, were, uh, were going to be on the, in the next week. So from Sunday to Sunday would be eight days is how it would be counted. So again, it's Sunday night. They're gathered in the upper room, not for worship, not for celebration, uh, but also again for the fear of the Jews, obviously. Locked in the upper room, again for fear. And Jesus, he comes in, this, this glorified state that he's in, this resurrected body, and he materializes and appears in substance, in the body, in the room, phasing through the walls. Interesting, isn't it, that he has this body that is uh, tran that is uh, tangible yet can transmutate or come through barriers and be intangible. I don't know how that works out, but simply it does happen. Jesus says the exact same words to Thomas and the other other ten disciples that he said the week previous, which is "Peace be with you." Peace is that uh, Jewish expression of shalom, right? It's that's the idea that we're speaking here, or in. Jesus is Aramaic to Salom, right? Which means the same thing. It's peace. It is calm. It is don't have fear. And he, again, when he appears in one more time, he has to assure them not to be frightful, not to be fearful or frightened that he is not a ghost and there's nothing to worry about as far as persecution, that he has come to comfort and encourage them. Verse 27. Then he, Jesus, said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. It's interesting, at least I think it's interesting, that Jesus offers the exact proof that Thomas demanded the week before. The exact evidence, Thomas, unless I see the wounds and can place my finger in his wounds, I'll never believe. And Jesus, who is who's all-knowing, knows that Thomas demanded that, and now he offers that as proof. Uh, proof of the actual resurrected and now glorified bodily state that Christ is in, he demands Thomas to see those injuries and to see that he's the actual the same, uh, the same person who was crucified is now in a glorified state. 
Now, it's interesting here that, that Jesus does not offer future generations the same kind of physical, physical, tangible proof of a resurrected body. Uh, he will show the apostles this, he will appear to them uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, more than 500 witnesses, that he's in a resurrected, glorified state. But for future generations of Christians, he does not offer this proof uh, that he's going to be a tangible ex existence. He doesn't offer to you and I this. It's by faith that we believe this, and we'll see in just a moment why, why this is. Verse 28, in seeing Christ, Thomas has an epiphany. He realizes uh, the light bulb goes on, the aha moment. He says, Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Doubting Thomas, right? He offers one of the most concise statements regarding the deity of Christ in the Holy New Testament. He calls him my Lord and my God. This, uh, this carpenter's son from Nazareth was not just an ordinary man. He was not a man who just came back from the dead like, say, Lazarus would have. Because at this time, Lazarus is still living. He's not someone who's come back from the dead like the widow of Nain's son. He's not just come back from the dead like uh, uh, Jairus' daughter. Nope. No, he's come back from the dead. There's something qualitatively different about Jesus. He's not just raised from the dead. He is the risen Lord. And Thomas says it uh, in a point, of, a point of praise and exclamation. He says, my Lord, my boss, my master, and my God. If Christ was not God, you think that he would have corrected Thomas at this point and said, no, Thomas, you're, you're mistaken. I'm, I'm really the angel Gabriel. I'm the first creation of God. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm God's ambassador. I'm God's first uh, prophet. Nope, he doesn't. He doesn't deny his deity. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't turn Thomas away. He doesn't deflect worship from this point. During Christ's ministry, it was a pretty common experience that Christ would often deflect worship to the Father. He would do a miracle, they'd praise him, and he'd give praise to the Father. It was a very common practice. Here he doesn't do that. After the resurrection, after the glorification, uh, the worship to Christ is, is all due him, of course, and he does not deflect that. It's interesting. He, he, he receives the praise of Thomas. He acknowledges him as not just his master, but also his God. Very interesting. What radical, what radical transition, a transformation had happened in Thomas's life that he sees this Jewish uh, carpenter uh, by, by trade, this itinerant rabbi, this, this man Jesus, to go from just seeing him as a regular man to seeing him as God. Now, if he, Christ was not God, then in fact what happens here is blasphemy. And that's a very powerful statement. To see Christ in his... Uh, incarnate state, whether they're glorified or not, and think that he's gone, it was blasphemous, unless, of course, he is gone. Verse 29, Jesus said, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed means favored of God. Are you favored of God because you've seen the Christ, because you've seen me? Jesus says, of course. He's implying, yes, you're blessed because you've seen me. But now, Jesus will go a step further to the next generation of believers who he will not reveal himself to in this way. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who believe without such physical evidence. And of course, this is a reference to all future generations of Christians, future from Thomas's point, who will believe not based upon seeing the tangible resurrected Christ, but based upon hearing the gospel preached and have the Holy Spirit draw them to belief. Blessed are those who believe without demanding proof of a resurrected body. Now, we believe the resurrection happened in a very physical state, but not because we've seen it physically, but because we believe in the truth, trustworthiness of the apostles' message. The Gospel of John wraps up by repeating this phrase in verse 30. It says it twice, once in this chapter and then once again in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And it, it's word for word, verbatim repeated. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. The Gospels are not perfect biographies of Jesus. I mean, here, even John admits to omitting details of Jesus' life. If they are perfect biographies, every moment of his life would have been captured. They're not perfect biographies, but the Gospels are perfect Gospels. And many events that Christ did and things that he taught and, and places that he went and the miracles that he performed are not in the Gospels. But through the Holy Spirit, 
through the, the heart, the mind, and the pen of the apostles, we have exactly what God intended for us to have. No, while there could be things omitted, there, certainly there were things that Christ did, there's nothing um, that's in here that, did, that we should not be in here, obviously. The Gospels are, are perfectly complete as they are. But John just says, look, there's a lot of miracles Christ did, implying as many other signs that he gave of himself, but these are written for a purpose. In fact, as we get to the last verse of this chapter, John says this, but these are written, so you may believe Jesus Christ, the, uh, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Gospels have an agenda. When John closes his Gospel out, he tells us, he shows his hand, and he tells us the whole motive for, for writing his Gospel. They're written for the purpose of convincing the reader that Jesus is, of course, the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, and he's the divine Son of God, and he's the author of salvation. These are written so you believe those things. We look tonight as we close out the Gospel of John, uh, this devotional tonight, we see a man who did not believe because he demanded a physical sign. And John wrote his Gospel saying, look, these are written so that you might believe. You who read this years later will believe that Christ was who he said he was. We appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. Thank you for en enduring a little bit of this. Uh, Watch it this week. If you have a comment, you can just jump in with that. We look forward to your, your comments this week. We'll, we'll pick them up later. We can make comments between, the, between now and Wednesday. Tune this Wednesday evening. Tune in 6 o'clock Wednesday for the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be in chapter number 2, uh, which is chapter which will be lesson number 3 in your books. We got through the genealogy last week. Go through the Christmas narrative in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be Matthew chapter number 2. And that's this Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Also, remind you, if you would like to give the Andy Armstrong Easter offering, please do so. You can mail that to the church treasurer. We're collecting that through the month of April, so a couple more opportunities to give. Uh, through the course of the month, please give as you feel led to do that. Uh, and send us your prayer concerns. And if you have a, uh, concerns or needs this time, let us know. We'll be glad to help however we can. Thank you. We'll close out with prayer. Well, as we close out this time, we ask that you would be with those in the sound of my voice, either listen to this live or in recording. We ask, Father, you would be with those who have doubt. Remind them that... Uh, that faith comes through hearing, hearing through the Word of God. We pray, Father, that those who, who hear uh, the truth being taught, the truth being preached, let the Holy Spirit come to find salvation full and free. Be with those brothers and sisters in Christ who go through periods of doubt. We pray that you give them a strength in these days ahead. Father, we pray for those affected by uh, the virus these days. We, we pray for those who are sick, for those who lost loved ones. Now keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Godspeed.